What's up guys, this is Jan for Chess24. In this video, we shall have a look back at the action in Paris Grand Chess Tour Day 3. And that means the last day of Rapid Games. Three more Rapid Games were played today. It's not the end of the tournament, there shall be 18 more Blitz Games. But for now, we will have a look at what happened in the Rapid. The world champion Magnus Carlsen went into the day leading the pack and... He probably had mixed feelings about his day because he could not win his first two games. And especially the first one, a rematch for the recently concluded World Championship match against Sergei Kayakin, must have left a strange taste in his mouth. Because in this position, after Queen to d3, Kayakin inexplicably played the move knight to e7, giving up the h7 pawn. And after bishop takes h7, white was just a pawn up. I'm not quite sure what Kayaki missed. Maybe he thought rook takes d4 to distract one of the pieces from h7 would work. But then, of course, this bishop goes away with check. Best is bishop e4 check, stopping rook takes h4. And next move. White picks up the rook. So Kayaki instead had to play rook h5 and had to struggle on a pawn down. However, no better defender out there than Sege Kayakin, arguably. And Kayakin managed to hold this position. He could have maybe even achieved more if here he would have found the computer recommendation, the move g5. g5 chases the rook away. The most plausible square is the e4 square. And now after rook e4, very surprisingly, black can win material in this position. It's hard to figure out why, even after seeing it. Knight f4, bishop f4, g f4. And it turns out that there is no real defense against the threat of c5 picking up the knight on d4. It's a strange construction, and I've never seen anything like it. But it does work. Why? It's just overloaded. So, yeah, Kayakin maybe could have achieved even more there, but... For 95% of the game, Magnus Carlsen was in the driver's seat and probably wasn't too happy with the final result. That game was followed by another draw against, who was it, um, Fabiano Caruana, who had a better day on day three than on day one and two. And then in the last game, Magnus Carlsen faced the Frenchman Etienne Bacro with the white pieces, a quiet Gioco Piano, as you see so often these days, became a lot less quiet here. After e5, Carlsen ambitiously played d5, trying to stop this knight from getting back to his own camp with knight e6. And Bacro correctly decides to spice up the situation, not back down, but go c6, g3, c takes d5, sacrifice a piece. And after g takes f4, d4, rook e a3, knight takes f4. The situation got very messy. White is a piece up, but black has a powerful knight on f4 and two pawns for it. So that in a practical game at least, this could go either way. But Magnus Carlsen is displaying some, well, very, very good chess from here on. Starts with knight e1, covering g2, clearing the file for his rook. Both his rooks are doing a stellar defensive job. After d5, knight to g3, rook to c8, knight to g2. White had already sort of outmaneuvered black. The queen was coming to g4 and was on his way to taking over the initiative. Of course, after king h8, queen g4, things got even tougher for black. But yeah, Carlsen just played a very good game there. But Crow tried g d3, tried to mix it up. That didn't help. This is... The very rapid conclusion, Carlsen converted his extra piece in the position after d takes e4. He could have maybe won more quickly by playing rook to d7. I guess he didn't do it because of g6 when his rook would be trapped, his knight would be trapped almost. But there is the cute little trick, rook h7, king h7, queen d7 check. Still, very good showing by the world champion, who sounded a bit salty when asked after the game by Maurice Ashley. And why this game hadn't been so smooth, I'm paraphrasing. And he said, yeah, what do you want? You can't get a big advantage every game and then convert it. Of course, it's not smooth 
if he doesn't do anything wrong in a complicated position. Once again, I'm very much paraphrasing, but yeah, Magnus wasn't happy that it sounded like his accomplishment was being diminished or it sounded to him and yeah, made his unhappiness feel very good game by Magnus Carlsen, but only two out of three on this last day, which maybe also slightly contributed to his unhappiness. Still, he remains in the lead, but there is a pack of players chasing him. Let's have a look at the standings and then some examples from these player games. Alexander Grishuk stands out with 13 out of 18 only one point behind Magnus Carlsen. In case you're wondering why is it 18 or 14, it's because you get two points for a win in the Rapid, but not in the Blitz, where you only get one 18 Blitz games to follow. So Grishuk, one point behind. Nakamura, two points behind. Shah Mamedyarov, three points behind. And Mamedyarov, however, was in very good position in the tournament earlier. And let's have a look at one of his games. Shah Mamedyarov had a fantastic 2017 all around in classical. He reached 2800. And in this tournament, he's shown that he very much belongs in this company. This position is one that he makes look like forced checkmate pretty much. Always been one of the more exciting attacking players out there. And look how easy he makes it look. Queen to h4. Rook to g3. Playing to bring the knight in. g6. Not wasting any time breaking open the position, sacrificing the e5 pawn, f5. Knight to f5. Just improving his position further. Queen h5 is a big threat. Queen to f6, trying to exchange queens, but of course not happening. Queen h5 using this pin. Rook to e6 and knight h4. Very nice move. Getting to the g6 defender. Bishop g7, knight takes g6, queen f7, and bishop to h6, exchanging the best defender Black has for his bishop on c1 that was doing nothing. And that means the game is pretty much over. And indeed, Topolov resigned after knight of 8 bishop takes g7 without waiting for something like knight g6, rook g6, queen g6, queen h8 check, king f7, queen f8, and checkmate. So typical Mamedyarov attack who was doing great in the tournament as mentioned. But then he would find his master on that day and that was Alexander Grishuk, who we've already seen took second place in the standings, went on to win all his games, I think four games in a row now, and in the last round of the day, was it the last round? I'm not even sure, but he did defeat Shah Mamedyarov along the way. I believe winning some sort of theory battle, because in this position after f3, I'm not sure if it's theory, but it seems like this knight should have withdrawn immediately to c5 or g5, keeping the c6 square covered, because after knight b3, which Mamedyarov played, a takes b3, knight c5, b4, knight went to d7, this Grishukian knight on c6 became a powerhouse. Knight c6, queen e8, knight d2, and white has the simple plan of controlling the board with his horses. Knight b6 might have been the most tenacious, but even then after takes, takes, bishop e3, bishop c5 is threatening, f4 is coming, Black position is very unpleasant. Instead, Mamed Yarov tried bishop h4, but Grishuk very straightforwardly goes for position with good knight against bad bishop and went on to win that quite convincingly. At this level, such a position is almost impossible to defend. The knight goes to d4, white builds his attack, the black king is weakened, the bishop can't contribute, and Grishuk made it look easy. Fantastic tournament so far for Alexander Grishuk, who's also is he the reigning world blitz champion? I always mix up everything, but he's a good blitz player. So he will certainly be a factor to be reckoned with in the fight for tournament victory. The same goes for Hikaru Nakamura, of course, two points behind. Which is not that much once the blitz starts. And Nakamura had a very curious finale to his game against Topalov. Where in this position, Nakamura decided to go for the attack with the powerful move rook h6, threatening all kinds of nasty along the h file. And Topalov collapsed quite quickly after queen g2, queen b1, check, king f2, queen c2, check, 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 king to f7, tending rook h1 or bishop to b5. There is no defense, black is winning. And 
the game did not last much longer. Instead, however, after rook h6, you've probably already wondered, why didn't he take the bishop? And I guess the answer is king f7. Now this rook is under attack and rook h1 check is as powerful a threat as ever. But white has a very cute way to make a draw here. And that's, I, I'm aware, rook e7 followed by checks is also possible. But I wanted to show you the cuter way here. Rook to h8, beautiful move. One point being that if you take the rook e6 check, wins the queen. Well, if you give this check on h1, king g2, this rook is blocking the h-file from behind, controlling the h3 and the h2 square. You still can't take it because of e6 check, so the best black could do is give it perpetual here. Rook h2, king g2, and so on. So, missed opportunity there for a very cute draw for Veselin Topalov. One man that did not miss the opportunity for a very cute draw is MVL, also still in the running. And in this position against Fabiano Caruana, faced with lethal mating threats, found a very nice draw with queen takes h6 check. Takes, takes. And no matter where this black king is gonna run to, it will get checked by the white rook. You get the idea. Oops, uh, blunder mate here. Okay, one should not blunder mate. Instead go king d8 and it would be a draw. Anyway, slightly better day for Fabiano Caruana, but still a rough outing for him in this tournament so far. Then again, everybody up till here still has a chance to influence tournament victory with 18 blitz rounds still to come. So there is plenty of excitement to look forward to over the weekend. Thank you guys for watching these highlight videos. Have a nice weekend. See you soon. Bye.